When a freshman comes to Staples, they are immediately hit with the impression that this school prides itself on not just one method of education. Besides the traditional math and science classes, Staples strives to create an atmosphere of all different types of learning material. Without these two amazing teachers, Staples would not be given the impression of having such incredible depth. Mike Zito and Jim Honeycutt, while they may not remember most of our names, have contributed so much to the Staples legacy. The award-winning radio station and the ever-so-popular narrative film class are just a few examples of just how special these two teachers really are. Please welcome the media bros themselves, Mike Zito and Jim Honeycutt. Who was that? What was his name again? Uh, how about actually giving it up for Sammy? He's doing a great job, isn't he? Um, we are incredibly honored to be here, and we want to send our congratulations out to the class of 2012. Tomorrow's the last time you are going to be together as a group. A new chapter in your life story is waiting to be written. You're going to be meeting up with some new people, and some of those people will become really important in your life, and you don't know who they are. In fact, an old philosopher once said, hey, you never know. And, and let, let me tell you about this old philosopher. Um, his name is John Luke, and he is also graduating this week. He's graduating from Stanford. Um, my wife taught him when he was in first grade. John Luke is a real little kid, the littlest one in the class. And he's got an incredible amount of personality, and he's incredibly cute, and he has a lot more personality than he has work ethic. Um, so towards the end of that first grade year, my wife Joni went up to him and said, hey, hey John Luke, do you think you're going to get enough to get on and get promoted to second grade? And he, he looked up at her, and he, was, he looked way up at her, and had those big eyes and said, you never know. And over the last 10 years or so, Joni and I have had many occasions to say to John Luke, or say that John Luke said, hey, you never know. And actually, Honeycutt and I are going to use that phrase a couple of times, but that's for later. Um, we'll get to that. First, uh, we'll start off with both of us when we were in the same place you were. We were just graduating from high school. And actually, that would be about 15 years before we ever got to meet each other. So take it away. All right. So let's see where we are. Ah, uh, yes, I remember it quite well. <laughs> I was once in the same position you were the night before graduation, and that's about where you are now. So anyway, let me, let me tell you this. Um, I uh, grew up in Woodhaven, Queens, New York, about 10 miles from Manhattan. I attended Christ the King High School, a, uh, a uh, regional Catholic high school in Middle Village, Queens, famous for its basketball players, and I was one of them, actually. Uh, I was in the first, first graduating class, and I spent a good part of my high school years playing basketball. And I also did play guitar, and that was an important, important thing for me, too. I was in many rock and roll bands with my cousin Walter, and we, we really had a good time. Playing guitar was, uh, was going to be one of those things that I took off to college with me. So, so guitar was going to play an important role for me. I went to uh, Lakewood High School in Lakewood, New Jersey. That's a recent picture, and notice two things. The graffiti there, that's recent. That wasn't around. But what's still around today and was around then is the nickname, the single worst nickname in the world. We were the Piners. Lakewood, the home of the pine, I don't know. It's, uh, it was embarrassing, they had a little guy with an ax and stuff like that. But the thing about Lakewood wasn't so much Lakewood or wasn't so much Lakewood High School, it was where it was, or actually what was around it. Um, Freehold, where Bruce Springsteen grew up, was just to the north, but more importantly to the south there, where I spent a lot of high school days was Seaside Heights, New Jersey. Um, it was 
a great place, and um, it was wholesome, and it's much like it is today, you know, boardwalk and everything like that, and um, seaside back then, this is a newspaper article from 1972, and you can see it, it's wholesome, it's innocent, the seaside youth, they're concerned about child safety issues, and it's, like I said, much like it is today, where the seaside youth, it's wholesome, and, and it's innocent, and the, the, the youth there is concerned about safety issues. That, that's one more piece of graffiti. The thing I didn't mention about the high school days for me was that I was pretty good in math. I did really well. I did really well on the SATs. I had no idea what I was going to do past high school, but I ventured out to college to become a math major. How'd the so, English go? Yeah, well, actually, I didn't mention that, but I, when, when I was in high school, I thought I was going to major in, in English in college, and I thought I'd play college basketball because I had played four years at, at, uh, at, at, in my school. And off to, uh, to college I went. And you know what? None of that happened. So uh, I um, wound up not playing basketball. I did not major in English. But I did keep playing my guitar. And that actually was a good thing for me because uh, I met a whole bunch of wonderful musicians while I was at Fairfield University. And we got ourselves a rock and roll band together. And by the time graduation rolled around, we were uh, still together and we really wanted to make a go of it. So we, um, we graduated and we started playing locally. And actually, we played for two years in Westport, downtown, there was a place called La Crepe. Hanny may want to pause this for a second. We played at a place called La Crepe, which was uh, where William Pitt Real Estate is, uh, Sotheby's on Myrtle Avenue and, and the Post Road, at the intersection of those two places. We played for a year there, and then we moved over to Mark's Place, which was across from Klein's on Main Street in Westport. So we played a lot in Westport. And so what was interesting, though, is in 1971, we were invited to, um, to play at an outdoor concert on Jessup's Green, which was the first Earth Day. And uh, there we are. Uh, that's actually us on, on stage in, on Jessup's Green. You can see the, the buildings in the background. This was sort of shot from where the library is. And uh, there I am in the middle playing guitar. Um, what we didn't know in the audience that day was Andrew Lug Oldham, who was the producer of the Rolling Stones. And uh, he really liked the band a lot. And so uh, he started to pursue us. And uh, we signed a recording contract, a th three, uh, three record deal with Motown, um, a subsidiary label of Motown called Mo West. And so we made three record albums. The first one was called Already a Household Word. There's the second one. And the third album was a live album done in front of an audience, much like this. And uh, we, um, the sound man for my band, uh, Jimmy Higgins, uh, shot Super 8 video, of, of actually film, of, of that performance. And so I digitized it and synced it up in Pro Tools. And uh, I have some footage of that performance. I, um, Rada, were you taking notes or anything like that? <laughs> um, I, I did get to see repairs uh, numerous times, and, and I can attest to the fact that the audience was nothing like this, actually. Um, I saw them many times there at the University of Bridgeport, which is where I became that math major. Um, and, and the University of Bridgeport has probably the second worst nickname in the world. Um, we, we were the Purple Knights. <laughs> um, you'll see an early picture of me at the University of Bridgeport. This sort of sets the time. Uh, you'll notice the um, <laughs> Fu Manchu. Uh, Hannah, don't get... No, no, Hannah. Oh, okay. Um, look, I wasn't a math major for long. Uh, in fact, I was a math major for less than I had the Fu Manchu. And that's mostly because um, I got into radio, WPKN, 
the Purple Night Network. <laughs> Radio became my passion, and indirectly, it's how I met up with Honeycutt. So why don't you take it from here? <clears throat> well, as it turned out, the band didn't make it. And uh, in spite of the fact we had three very, very, very good albums. Uh, so uh, to, um, to pay the bills and uh, to go on to my next uh, career interest, I um, took a whole bunch of different types of jobs. So I sold my guitar, left the music business, went back to grad school at Fairfield University, and had an assort assortment of different types of jobs uh, to pay for things, you know. So one of the jobs I had was sort of an intriguing job. I was a DJ at, uh, at a disco. A disco in the south end of Bridgeport. And yes, I was the disco dude. And uh, um, I worked there for a while, uh, spinning records for the disco crowd. And um, it, it, it did what I needed to do. It paid the bills, got me through grads, it paid for grad school. So um, anyway, in the... Um, Fall of 1975, I got my first teaching job at a private school, and uh, I had to leave Barnaby's, so they hired somebody to replace me. <laughs> so, Disco dude junior. <laughs> so uh, Zito came along, and, uh, and I trained him. The training was, here's this piece of vinyl. Here, here's how it goes on. And I remember the vinyl. It was James Brown. Oh, that was our first song? Get up yeah. all, that was our, that was our first that was dance. That's <laughs> our first song. Get up off of that thing. Hand it if you will. Get up off of that thing. And stand to do you better. Get oh, no, wait, wait, wait. He thing. also showed me the and light show that was now. in singing. Get up off of that thing. And dance to you you better. Um, we stayed there for a little while, and then we got up off of that thing, and um, kind of sorry you had to see that. Went um, our, when our separate ways, as I said. Um, I, I managed a coffee house, very, very different music, um, and there, that's me in my overalls, which were the thing I wore all the time, no more Fu Manchu. Soon after that, I decided I would become a performer too. That's me in a bubble. Um, I started this show called Bubble Rific, and um, you laugh. It was physics. Uh, all right, all right, you don't believe me, huh? I'll show you. Here, here's a clip from Channel 3. Always something at hand that you can use to make some great bubbles. Something at hand. <laughs> Now, on first night, I'll also be doing some sculptures. I'll be doing some square bubbles, and one that's inspired by the carousel over at Bushnell Park, I'll be doing a carousel bubble. Can we, uh, can we see that, or is... I'll give it a try. Hmm. All right. I wish we had a calliope here. The carousel bubble. Here comes the horses, Jerry. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, this is entertaining. <laughs> this is great. The Queen Show. This is a family news program, and this is family entertainment. Now, sometimes it doesn't really look like a carousel until I do this. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Great stuff. So this will all make sense. This all comes together. It gets very deep. Uh, so, um, so I attended grad school and got my uh, teaching credentials, my first master's degree. Eventually got a job teaching at Coley Town Junior High School in the fall of 1977. Uh, after a few years, I got transferred over to Long Lots, and there I taught social studies and English for the Pride of Lions. So I um, also started a club. We had club day on Wednesday afternoons, and uh, it, was, it was the rocket club. Yes, it was. We, we shot SD's rockets off. We never saw them again because the backyard of the school was too small, so that was the end of those things. But it was a lot of fun. Long Lots was terrific for me. I, my wife promised me I wouldn't say anything about her, but my classroom next door, she, she was in the classroom next door. So anyway, uh, so let's see. Where do we go from here, Zito? So. I think I take it. Okay, you're going to take it from you've here? You've effectively went from disco dude to rocket man. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I was performing, I was performing my bubble show all around, although you mocked me. It was doing pretty well. And in fact, one Saturday in 1994, I had a big gig. I went to um, 
Wallingford to the Oakdale Theater. I was the opening act of Sherry Lewis. <laughs> None of the kids know. She had this sock, you know, <laughs> lamb chop, and uh, song that never ends. And never... Here, watch this, watch this. Sticky, slimy sludge, a greasy, grimy, scluffy smudge, oozy, swampy, puddle splatter, gooey, gunky, cookie batter, blood and juice from sloppy joes. I guess it's time to change my clothes. So you wonder why this is important, right? Okay, so here's the deal. I was in the audience with my five-year-old daughter, Marianne, for that show. So I took, you know, I grew up in New York, loved Shari Lewis. I said, Marianne, you gotta see Shari Lewis, she's terrific. And Lamb Chop, oh, she, it's hot stuff. So, so ladies and gentlemen, to start our show this evening, Mike Zito and Bovel Riffick. Out comes Zito pulling a wagon with five gallons of soap suds. So yeah, that's, that's how it's, so after the, the show, I rushed the stage, it was pretty embarrassing. They don't usually get people rushing the stage during children's shows, but uh, I did, and uh, Zito and I caught up on, on old times. We hadn't seen each other for 20 years, so. And, and when we met up, I, I, it was great to meet up with him and, and meet Lamb Chop the same day. Um, but I also got to tell, um, tell Jim that I was switching careers. I was still going to do the bubble show, but I had also gone back to school to study to be a teacher. That's my second class there. It's in New Haven. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and and I, I had started um, a teaching career that's now in its 22nd year. So uh, when you least expect it, you'll uh, find yourself meeting up with people who will be important to you and, uh, and uh, as your future unfolds for you. Don't be surprised that you may find yourself making connections along the way uh, for, with, with people that, you know, you just think they're passing in your life. If you had told me at your high school, at my high school graduation, that I would be, sign a recording contract five years after my high school graduation, I probably wouldn't have believed you. If you had told me when I was a musician opening for Stevie Wonder that five years later I would be teaching junior high school English and social studies, I probably wouldn't have believed you. And if you had told me when I was a junior high school English social studies teacher that someday I would be teaching at Staples High School with Mike Zito, media, teaching kids like Ellen Kempner and kids like that how to make rock and roll records, I wouldn't have believed you either. And if you would have told me that that guy that taught me the disco light show to get up off of that thing um, was going to be as influential in my life as he is, uh, a person who got me the job here, got me the job at Coley Town, and also, truth be known, got me the job that I was in before I came to Coley Town, I wouldn't have believed it. But as this famous philosopher once said, you just never know. <laughs> All right, I got it. So listen, tomorrow this chapter closes for you. We are very proud of the stories that you've all started here at Staples High School. Realize that your plans that you made may change as you go along, as they did for me. So, but embrace those changes wherever they may take you. Like Jim said, we're really proud of the stories you started. Um, you heard a little bit of ours. Um, we're proud that you started yours here at Staples. But listen, we really look forward to tomorrow, but we especially look forward to the stories that you're going to create for yourselves. And please come back and let us know about those next chapters. We love you. Congratulations. <laughs>